Exodus. Seeing God in the journey of our lives. Looking at these people that God loves and God rescues. Seeing there's something that can be applied to us. Things about God's nature that we should learn. How He handles things. And if they go through struggles, He's there. If we go through struggles, He's there. He's always there. And so we want to see Him in our journey. Today, we're going to look at maybe one of the most famous passages of Scripture that even the most devout atheist probably knows of. In Exodus 19 and 20, we're going to be taking a look at what's called the Decalogue or the Ten Commandments. Somebody out there may have an idea of Genesis 1-1, but my guess is they, if it can be atheists, never heard the Bible, read the Bible, wouldn't even care about Genesis 1-1. Wouldn't maybe not even know any of the statements of Jesus about I am the bread or I am the water or any of that. They may not have even heard John 3.16, because a lot of people don't share that anymore, and they haven't gone to church their entire life and did not memorize it as a seven-year-old, for God so loved the world. They may, by just hearing it around, throw out, judge not lest you be judged, having no concept of what that means, and just calling anybody out on saying anything that makes them feel bad. That's possible. But they do know the Ten Commandments or have heard of them and might reject them for various reasons. But we're looking at that today. But here's the thing. When was the last time you heard a pastor cover the text with the Ten Commandments and the Ten Commandments are not primary in the message? You haven't. We're looking at chapter 19 and 20, and they are three days in the life of Israel that will change their relationship with God forever. Three days. They've come out of bondage. They've crossed the Red Sea. They see the hand of God and the the pillar of uh, smoke and the, the pillar of fire. They've eaten the manna, they've drinking the water supplied, they've had the quail, they've seen God's victory over a battle with the Amalekites, and now they have come to the mountain of God, Mount Sinai. We finally got there, folks. Here they are. Took them two months to get there. They will stay here about ten months. You may not realize that, but they'll, they're going to be here for a, a while before they start heading north again towards Canaan and the promised land. But something happens here in these three days that changes their approach to God and access to God. And I want to talk today about approaching God, access to God. I'm not a thief. One of the commandments is thou shalt not steal. That is not something I, I do. If I get a stamp from the office, I put money in for the office. If I take paper clips, I put some money in the little slot to take pay for paper clips. If I make personal prints at the copy machine, I pay for that. I am not a thief. But I have been once. After that, I never stole again. I was eight years old. And on the way to the swimming pool from my house, a block and a half away, you could walk around a big building. We cross Broadway, and you go around the building to the swimming pool on the other side of that. Or you could go through Don Wilson Drug. Don Wilson Drug had a front area where it's all kinds of little something. I don't know. It's a pharmacy. It was a pharmacy. And in the back, it had a place where you can get sodas and floats and shakes and sit there old school. And it was awesome. And I would go through there to the pool and back, and one day I was looking around and I saw a bag of candy. It looked pretty good. A lot of colors that looked really good. 
I didn't even know what the candy tastes like. May never had it, but it drew my attention, and I snuck that into underneath my towel and got home. Now, in my house, it's an old house, and there were tongue and groove walls and stuff, and one of them was loose, and so you could slip this out, and in the joist of the wall upstairs, I had a little stash. I had all my little treasures, my little G.I. Joe figurines and all that type of stuff, <clears throat> and I stuck this candy in there, <laughs> and I just ate some, and every time I ate it, I didn't feel good about it. I, did, I did, shouldn't have done that. Shouldn't have done that. Then my sister friend, two years my elder, was in my room and said, hey, friend, I got some candy for you. I want some candy. She said, what? So I sneak into my little slot and pull out this little bag of candy. And she goes, where'd you get that? Well, then I became a liar. <laughs> First a thief and then a liar. But she knew something was up and I can't remember if she told mom or something happened and I told mom. I don't know. I just felt guilty. And my mom said, oh, okay, come with me. We took the bag of candy, we went to Don Wilson, and I had to go to the man and say, I stole this from you, and I'm sorry. And I did. He forgave me, and he said, I'll, I'll, I'll do this. It's open, it's worth about this. You come in tomorrow and sweep some floors, and we'll call it even. So I had to pay a little bit. I didn't get spanked. She did spank me when I was a kid. It broke my heart. Didn't want her to hurt her hand. <laughs> she was not a spoon person. She was a hand person. And it felt very broken because I love my mother. But the shame, the shame of it. There were times when she'd say, wait till your father gets home. You ever heard that? Maybe you've heard that in movies and stuff like that, and those are the, those are the words of fear that every child dreads, <laughs> and I did as well. And so prior to dad getting home, I would probably find myself someplace else other than at the house. Make myself scarce. Make myself small. Waiting. And it always came. Dad was not a spanker. But he was a scolder, and his words were harsh, and it hurt. To the point it hurt so much that I, I, I probably ran from my dad more, distanced, distanced myself from my dad more. Maybe I didn't have the love for my dad that I had with my mom, but there was something that separated me from him, and it was hard to approach him, to access him, to know him, maybe as a child should have. But I didn't want to hear the hard words. I didn't want to hear his position on my behavior and the shame I might feel because of it. I feared discipline. Yeah, I feared the words. I, I feared the shame of knowing I had done wrong. I'd let someone else down, and I let myself down too. I didn't like it. Who does? As we look at the people of Israel today, these three days bring about some things in their life that will change them, change their relationship with God. And I'd like to look at that with you. And this kind of goes into two parts here. One is just kind of, let's go through the story together, chapters 19 and 20. And if you've got your Bibles, I really would recommend you opening them because I'm not covering every verse. I'm not going through the entire two chapters. I may not even read the entire Ten Commandments. In fact, I won't. But if you have it in your hands, you can see where I'm going as I'm jumping through points and the happenings of what's going on here in this story story where the fear of God begins to limit the people's access to God. And that's what's going on here. They get to the mountain in chapter 19. They've traveled and now they're around the mountain and the first thing that happens is Moses goes up the mountain. 
Look at verse 5 and 6. Therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all the peoples, for the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. Moses goes up, and this is what God says. He goes up alone, and God speaks to him, obey me, keep my covenant, be my people. Everything is mine, but I'm calling you to be priests. I want you to be a holy nation. Tell the people this. So Moses comes down and he says, hey, I got something for you. And he relays the message that God has given him. And they respond. He calls the elders, the people. He tells them. He tells them exactly what God has said. And in verse 8 it says, all the people answered together and said, all that the Lord has spoken we will do. And then Moses reports the words of the people to the Lord. So he goes up the mountain, gets a word, comes down, tells the people. They say, that sounds good. We're in. Forty days later, they've got a calf made out of gold, and they're worshiping it. Just over a month, and they've turned on this. But in this moment, sounds good. Everything he says to do, we will do. Yay! And then so Moses goes up and tells the Lord. And so, what does God tell Moses? He says, Something's going to happen in three days' time. So, I want you to tell the people to consecrate themselves. Be ready for what I have to say. You agree, you want to be my people. And you're going to obey all the words. Well, I've got some words for you. I want you to prepare yourself for what I have to say to you. So consecrate yourselves. And he gives two instructions. Wash your garments. Be clean. Wash yourselves in preparation for my coming. In verse 10, the Lord said to Moses, go to the people. Consecrate them today and tomorrow and let them wash their garments Be ready for the third day, for on the third day the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. Wash your garments. You can read down further that he has another area of washing and cleansing, or if you wouldn't mind, potentially a limit, where he says in verse 15, be ready for the third day, do not go near a woman. So we have a washing and we have a set of limits, and one of the aspects of Not being the woman is that you're, and I'll get to it when it comes to, when you come to the Lord, everything in your life, all your garments, all your outer appearance needs to be not presented as something special that you have brought to the table, that you've arrived and you're welcoming and you're worthy of the welcome. You're not worthy, but come clean. Don't bring any of your, your garbage to me and say, my garbage is beautiful. Don't bring your intimacy to me and say, I value the intimacy more than what I'm going to give you, which is my intimacy. This is about a covenant with you and me. It's a precursor to the bridegroom and the bride. And he says, no, in right now I want you to refrain yourself and restrain yourself. And we used to always talk about this with football players. Don't go party the night before a game. Of course, some coaches would say, hey now, don't be sleeping around. Don't do anything Why? Because the strength is drained. And God wants them to be ready to receive what He has with no restraint, no restrictions, and yet He has placed this limit, a couple of limits actually. They're not to come all the way up the mountain. They're not to come up the mountain at all. You can see that. Verse 12, take care not to go up into the mountain or touch the edge of it. Whoever touches the mountain shall be put to death. So there's a limit. When the trumpet sounds, they can come up to the mountain, but not on the mountain. Verse 22 says the priests need to consecrate themselves, prepare their, themselves. And he says, now Aaron can come up in verse 24. So nobody can come up except for God's emissary and the high priest. Everybody else, be ready. He comes. Then we see in chapter 20, verses 1 through 21, that God does speak. These famous, famous words called the Ten Commandments. 
Now, we don't see it until after the fact, and this is always interesting to me when I read this text, that on that third day when the Lord shows up, He speaks these words and we read them, but it's not until after we see how He says it. <laughs> Look at verse 18, just before a trumpet Blows, they shall come and surround the base of the mountain, and thunder, and the flashes of lightning, and the sound of the trumpet, and the mountain smoking. This voice booms out. Yeah, let's. How would you respond? I'd be terrified. Wouldn't you be terrified? Lightning strikes, thunder booming, smoke moving here and there, and clouds coming and fire raging, and this voice coming out, thou shalt not. I, I, I think I'd fall on my face, and I don't know what to do. I'd be terrified. I might run away. But we see he lays out these first 10 of 613 laws. These are preeminent. He speaks to all the people. These Ten Commandments, and the first four are really about Him. Respect that which is holy. There's no one or anything holy other than God. So don't have any other gods. Nothing before me. Not your family, not your job, not your wealth, not your kids, not your spouse. Nothing before me. Don't make any graven image to worship. Don't bow down to anything that you've put some, ascribed some power to that's a created thing. Why would you do this? Come to the holy. Don't profane my name, and it's not speaking GD, although that does profane his name. It means you're an image bearer. Everywhere you go, don't put shame to my name. I, I told a story yesterday at the prayer breakfast that whenever Brandon or Brittany would go out and do something, I'd say these words. Now listen, you're bearing my name, the foster name, don't bring shame to my name. You bear the foster name, don't bring shame to your name. And we're a family that serves the Lord, don't bring shame to Christ's name. We all make mistakes, but pretty much I would say that kids did that. Got words from many people saying how wonderful these two young people were as they went and visited different people and how they represented themselves wonderfully. Praise God. I'm, I'm glad for that. I'm thankful for that. Even from across the world would get letters saying, wow, your son is an amazing young man. Wow, your daughter is just so gracious. It's wonderful. But don't profane his name. Don't abuse the holy day. I've called this day sacred. If I'm going to rest, you're going to rest. There's reasons for this. These are holy. Not just respect which is holy, which is Him, but respect for others. The other six are about your relationship with other people. Honoring your parents, not murdering. No adultery, no stealing, no lying, no covet. These are old name, old words. It says kill, that means murder. Jesus said don't be angry in your heart toward the other person. Don't be rageful. Don't have malice, not just murder. Jesus speaking about adultery, he says, no, I want you to be completely pure, completely with fidelity. Stealing is about respecting others and their properties. Lying is about truth and faith. Covetousness is about jealousy. He lays these out there, and what happens? Is it the manner of how he presents himself? Is it these words that are so profound and so simple in many ways, and promises engaged in them of if you do this, you'll have a long life. If you do this, then a blessing to your generations. There's all kinds of good stuff in there, and you can look at it at your leisure. What happened in this moment is the people became afraid. And they say something that is so bizarre that I guess I have some understanding for it. But this is the moment when 
approaching God and accessing God changes forever. And the fear of God takes over the people. In verse 18 and 19, it says, Now when all the people saw the thunder and the flashes of lightning and the sound of the trumpet and the mountains smoking, the people were afraid and they trembled and they stood far off and said to Moses, You speak to us. We'll listen. But do not let God speak to us lest we die. I'm afraid of what dad's going to say. I don't want to approach dad anymore. Those words are so hurtful and they shame me so much. I don't want to be around him. I want to stand away from him. I want to hide from him. I want to hear my mother's voice, but I don't want to hear my father's voice. Don't let God speak to us anymore. Can you imagine Have you ever been there? I don't want to hear it anymore. I don't want God to speak to me. They they have a reaction. Please don't let God speak to us. It's a very dramatic experience. They had the honor of hearing the voice of God in all of His majesty. It was too much. His power. His authority, His clarity, His truth, His justice, accountability. This is what it means to be my people. This is a close encounter. (laughs) Sometimes when you have a close encounter with God, it can be troubling because when you come to God, He's not shy in saying to you, I love you. He's not shy in saying, you're my people, you're my child. Grab a hold of it because he's also going to say, because he's not shy, you need to deal with this. This cannot continue in your life. I've called you to holiness. You're representing me. Knock that off. If you've got an anger problem that just blurts out your fury, shut up. That's the most spiritual thing I can say. Shut your mouth. Malice and rage should not come out of the body of Christ. If you've got all kinds of issues and you've covered all your sins and you are the most professional liar in the world and you've got so many lies you can't even remember what lies you told, it's time to repent and come forward and clean it up. Speak truth, you don't have to remember a thing. When you encounter God, it might be comforting, but it will also be confronting. What do you do? Do you run? Do you reject? Their reaction is says, I don't want God to speak to me anymore. And so the request was, could you give me a mediator? You speak to us, Moses. We'll we'll listen to you. So rather than going to God, they want another person to give them the words of God. Praise God they have someone who actually cares about God and is committed to God and is accountable to God. But a lot of people go to people that are not close to God, are not close to the Word, are not sharing truth, and they want counsel from everything, but they never go to God. In the following generations, this idea of it being spoken down, Israel interpreted the law downward, easily obeyed. I'll listen to my rabbi, who hopefully has gotten the other rabbis to hear things from the Sanhedrin. And ideally, the Sanhedrin have consulted the high priest who at least once a year encounters God. So now Jewish people are following a trickle-down aspect of the words of God with some rabbi's interpretation that's so far off the mark 
that even in Jesus' time, he's saying, what's wrong with you? You've made it a Sabbath thing where I spit in the ground and healed a person, and you've called it making a brick that I'm working on the Sabbath. What is wrong with you? Now, let's not be too harsh on them. Christians do the same thing. Well, I want to go to this pastor because he doesn't talk about that topic. I'm going to go to this church because they're not going to deal with that sin. In fact, I don't even want to hear about sin, so I'm going to some other thing, or I'll just walk away. Guilty. Jesus exposed that shallow understanding in the Sermon on the Mount that he says, I have not come to abolish the law, but I've come to fulfill the law. All of it is in me. And he comes, says, come to me. And he deals with anger and lust and divorce and oaths and retaliation and loving enemies. And the whole gambit that's taking place right here, Jesus is proclaiming in the New Testament, this is what it's all about, the heart and truth and loving God and loving people. Philippians 3 says, when it comes to our own righteousness, that it's not even present, we got nothing, it says, but when we're found in Him, not having a righteousness of our own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, we, we come through faith in Christ, and all that is good, all that is righteous is in Him. It does not come from what we're reading today. Next week, I'm going to be talking about how do you look at Old Testament laws in a New Testament mindset. Christians handle it differently, and we'll look at that. So Moses addresses the fear, and he comes to this passage, and I'm running out of time, which is lovely. In 2020, it says, Moses said to the people, do not fear, for God has come to test you, and that his fear may be before you so that you may not sin. Don't fear, but be afraid. Don't be afraid. Fear. What? <laughs> what? It says you don't have to be afraid because God's testing you. Testing you how? He's testing to reveal what kind of God they were going to be serving. This test is going to reveal to them what God's expectations were for His people. This test was going to reveal their own weaknesses. Don't be afraid. God's testing you. He's showing you what you're getting engaged with, who you're engaged with, and what it means for you. You have to distinguish between these two kinds of fear. The fear that reveres God and the fear that runs from God. He says this this fear, this reverence of God, understanding His holiness and who He is, this test that proves you that you are His people is here. Why? So you won't sin. I love that. They're not dealing with it. They don't want it. And God reminds them, He says, okay, you don't get to hear my words anymore. I'll go through Moses. Boom, just like that. Nada. No more. They didn't hear his masses. Every now and then he'd give a word to a prophet. But the people couldn't hear. He was silent in their minds for 400 years. God reminds them of their holiness in verse 22. It says, you've seen for yourselves that I've talked from you with, he uh, with you from heaven. And he reminds them, hey, don't have any gods, no images. He says, listen, if you're going to pray to me and you make an altar, you don't cut it up yourself. You don't create it. You don't make it beautiful. You only use what I made and make up an altar from the earth. Don't you dare try to present anything beautiful that I haven't called you to do. He says, there's one God in his altar that will expose your nakedness in verse 26. There's nothing of your flesh in this place it's a covering of sacrifices. God will not allow our flesh 
and our deeds and our works and our ego to come before Him in any way. He says, okay, I'll talk through somebody else, but don't you dare serve another God. Don't you dare make an image. Don't you think your altar is something special. I've made this. There's one God and you serve me. Okay. John 4 says, God is spirit. Those who worship Him must worship Him in spirit and truth. None of our deeds, none of our rituals, you got to come open, naked before Him and say, okay, you, not me, yours, not mine. And verse 24 says, in every place where I cause my name to be remembered, I will come to you and I will bless you. This is after they said, don't speak to me. It's okay. Every place where I cause my name to be remembered, I'll come to you. I'll bless you. Goodness. That's just the story. I'm not going to read all the verses above. You've got them in your notes. But very quickly, the great spiritual takeaway And we'll be dealing with this really for weeks to come as we look at the tabernacle, the elements of the tabernacle, the entire understanding of the temple, the sacrificial system in light of Christ. Because in approaching God, you can revere Him or you can run from Him. But in Christ, we have access to God and we can approach Him through Jesus. He is our high priest He is our Moses figure. We can go to the Lord through Jesus straight away. We can go to God. It says in Ephesians, for through Him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. Ephesians 3, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence. Hebrews 4, let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace. Over and over, you can come to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's available to the Gentiles, it's available to Jews through Jesus, access granted. And Jesus says, wash. We're made clean in Christ. Don't bring your deeds before me. Come humbly. The servant will be acknowledged. You can't hold on to your life if you intend to submit to the Lord. First Corinthians says, you're washed, you're sanctified, you're justified in the name of the Lord. Revelation says, 7 says, they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. You see, not just He makes us clean, but He prioritizes the closest intimacy in our life. You can't love your wife more than you love Jesus. It's a hard word for some people. You can't love your daughter or son more than you love Jesus. God must be where your heart is and abides and resides. And yes, my friend, Christ talks about limits and parameters. A loving God cares about these things. It's called holiness. He sets boundaries in our life. We have access. We can approach Him. First John, read it. It's all about holiness, walking in holiness, love, truth, perseverance, having a testimony in Him. Finally, it's, I just say, fear Him, but don't run from Him. Come to Jesus. Be the people of God. Come and be blessed with all the blessings He has in eternity. He's promised to those He's called His children. Would you come? Don't be like the people of Israel says, I don't want to hear it. I'm afraid of it. There's judgment coming. His words will be convicting. I don't want to deal with my own crimes and sins. No, bring it to the cross. It's paid for. He's covered it. He's forgiving you if you come to Him and ask for forgiveness. Don't run away from Him. Run to Him. There's no fear in love. Perfect love casts out fear. Don't be afraid. Christ, the loving Savior, draws you to Him. 
First John says fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. Don't be afraid of God. Come to Him. He loves you. And I just close with these three things very quickly. You will have to face the glory of God, and that is terrifying. Straight up. He is a superior being, and fear will overwhelm you. Like when Adam recognized his shame, he hid from the Lord. Like when Isaiah saw the throne room, he fell on his face and said, I'm a man of unclean lips. Like everyone in the Scripture who saw who God was fell on their knees. you got to face his glory. And you have to face your guilt. His glory and holiness will reveal that we can't do it alone. He's a holy being. His glory shows a superior being, a supreme being. Our guilt shows that he's a holy being. Finally, it all leads to this. We make the transition here and now in the tabernacle as we move forward in Exodus to Christ. And in him all things fulfilled. In Christ, all offerings of sacrifice paid. His grace, you face the glory of God, you face the guilt of your sin, but you've got to face the grace of Christ. It's offered to you. He's a superior being. He's a holy being, but He is a forgiving being. Would you approach the Lord? Come to Him. Hear from heaven. Run to Him, be clean, be accepted. Some of you are, you're saved, you get this, but there are times you, you like Adam and me like Adam do something wrong and we hide and we run and we stand afar off just like these people do not do so. Run into the hands of a loving Father who stands ready to forgive. Pray with me. Thank you for this word, and it's not just the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments, Lord, but thank you that it's placed in this surrounding, this bubble wrap, this one unit package of your glory and who you are and who you're calling us to be, and we can't approach you, and... but there are limits, and there's cleansing, and there's purification. All that is about being with you and your voice, and let us not run. Forgive us, Lord. May we come in Christ and once again have access to you speaking directly to us because your spirit dwells in us and we have total confidence in approaching you for our needs and to exalt you. What a privilege that you said, I'm going to make a way to rectify this stupid moment of these people that I will be able to speak to all who would come. I'm going to make a way, and it's going to come through Christ. We thank you for that, Father. We love you for that. And may we not be shy in coming before you, but knowing that we come humbly. Have your way in us, in Jesus' name. Amen.